Coming up in today's newscast, former IDF Chief of Staff Benny Gantz finally opens up on his politics as he officially kicks off his elections campaign. Intel makes some massive investments in the Jewish state, and a new set of recommendations to fight sexual harassment in Israel is adopted. Former IDF Chief of Staff and the head of the new Israel Resilience Party, Benny Gantz, finally broke his political silence Tuesday at the official launching of his campaign in Tel Aviv. And during his speech, Gantz championed the idea of creating a united, unified, cohesive society while rejecting the values of the current Netanyahu-led government. He said that a bad wind blows through the country where divisions of left and right, secular and religious, Jewish and non-Jewish, threaten society. Adding that, quote, I have looked in depth at today's self-absorbed leadership, and it is not interested in you and not in us, end quote. Further, he said that a strong government governs to unite and doesn't govern in order to separate or rule. He then continued to challenge the prime minister and the Netanyahu government on issues of corruption, saying that his government would show zero tolerance for corruption of any kind, pointing to the fact that he himself has always kept his hands clean, too. Now, as for what he supports politically, Gantz has been largely silent in the media until now. But at the campaign launch, the former IDF head made a number of vows and clear assertions. With respect to security, he said that gone are the days of press conferences on the subject of the sanctity of security, and that he will stop the boasting and return to secrecy and deeds. He also directly challenged Iran and Hezbollah, telling them to back off or face dire consequences, issuing similar threats to the Palestinians. Though he also promised to be more pragmatic, like Rabin and Begin, who made peace with Egypt and Jordan. <laughs> He even gave credit to Netanyahu for his Bar Ilan speech, the Hebron evacuation agreement, and the Y agreement with Arafat. Still, he asserted that the government as a whole has taken a self-interested survivalist approach. Therefore, he thanked Netanyahu for his years of service, but added that, quote, we'll continue from here. Finally, he also discussed leading a revolution in equality of education, opportunity, pay and the price of goods, army and civil service, housing, health, and much more. Gantz is viewed as the biggest rival Netanyahu has faced in years, with most polls positioning him as a viable prime minister, or at least a strong leader in the opposition. Speaking of elections, social media giant Twitter has reportedly been hard at work suspending hundreds of accounts linked to foreign fake news manipulations campaigns from their platform. This just as Facebook unveiled its upcoming transparency safeguards scheduled to be operational by March. So far in Israel alone, nearly 350 suspicious bot accounts aimed at tainting the social dialogue have been kicked off of Twitter since December. Accounts with tens of thousands of followers. Additionally, reports say that most of the removed accounts were in English, though three were in Arabic and one was in German. But according to the Times of Israel, a source with knowledge of Twitter's relations with Israel said that the social media giant is working hard to protect the Israeli elections from fake and malicious accounts and posts, just as the platform does worldwide. In fact, the source added that over 10 million accounts are flagged and removed from Twitter weekly, with over 500,000 suspicious logins being addressed every day. Meanwhile, Facebook's transparency additions seem less concerned with removing malicious accounts and more with simply revealing the nature of suspicious accounts and posts. And critics argue that such measures are too little too late anyway, especially as the official release date for these measures hasn't been announced, only that it will be in March ahead of Israeli elections. As for other suggestions on how to preserve fair elections, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean, a group of 26 countries in North Africa, the Middle East, and Europe, including Israel, has offered to create a foreign observer force. Though Knesset Speaker Edelstein's office already rejected the offer, calling the mere suggestion an unparalleled expression of arrogance. In related news, as Israel gets closer and closer to elections in April, it seems that more and more political parties are popping up by the day. And while the vast array of choices representing all the different interest groups may seem like a good thing, the Israel Democracy Institute would say that it's not. In fact, according to Professor Gideon Rachat, a senior fellow with the Israel Democracy Institute, quote, we need to create a system of incentives which will solidify the political system into two main blocks. Rachat continued to explain that the current system, quote, grants small factions disproportionate power, leads to excessive preoccupation with coalition management, does not provide strong incentives for creating an effective opposition, and leads to the allocation of oversized budgets towards sectoral interests. Further, in order to convince Israelis that a return to two major parties would indeed be the healthiest thing for Israel's democracy, the Israel Democracy Institute has begun releasing a number of short explanation videos, which even include Israeli actor and icon Lior Ashkenazi. Israel is suffering from a 
מספר המושבים של שתי המפלגות הגדולות הוא אפילו לא חצי ממושבי הכנסת. כך נולדות כאן ממשלות מרובות מפלגות, שכל אחת מהן מחזיקה בכוח לא פרופורציונלי וסוחטת את מפלגת השלטון החלשה. יש לנו בחירות כל שנתיים וחצי בממוצע. יש לנו שר ביטחון ממפלגה של שישה מנדטים, שר חינוך ממפלגה של שמונה מנדטים, ושר פנים ממפלגה של שבעה מנדטים. וב-20 השנים האחרונות החלפנו 13 שרי פנים, 12 שרי אוצר ועשרה שרי חינוך. ככה אי אפשר לנהל מדינה. Now you may be asking yourself how we can go about accomplishing this idea. Well, Rachat and the videos claim that it can be done through just a few small changes. Chief among them is to make a law where the head of the largest faction after elections is automatically prime minister and would be in charge of organizing the coalition. Quote, this will encourage politicians to forge alliances before the elections and will encourage citizens to cast their vote for the largest electoral list. End quote. According to Finance Minister Moshe Kachlon on Tuesday, in return for an approved $1 billion grant, technology giant Intel has now agreed to invest $11 billion towards increasing its operations in Israel. Kachlon went on to explain on Army Radio that, quote, the moment the company comes to Israel and invests $10 billion and it receives a grant of 9%, that means that 91% of it stays here. There are always such discounts, there are always incentives, end quote. Additionally, the finance minister said that the massive investment is unprecedented and will likely bring with it thousands of new jobs to the Jewish state. Now, the news comes after Intel announced earlier this week that it intends to expand its operations into Israel, specifically in its Kiryat Gat manufacturing site. However, the investment, as Kachlon intimated, was contingent on the grant monies being approved. Additionally, schedules, costs, and other such details of the investment have yet to be released, but Intel's Kiryat Gat manager already said that the agreement still perfectly demonstrates the, quote, strong performance of Intel Israel, and we continue to lead in terms of corporate economic and social investments in Israel, end quote. Intel also currently already has plants and R&D centers in the Negev, Jerusalem, Petah Tikva, and Haifa. And finally, this move comes as the latest in a long line of Intel's $38 billion worth of acquisitions and expansions into Israel so far. In 2017, for example, the company purchased automotive software company Mobileye for $15 billion. And already, new reports additionally show that the tech giant also has bid around $5.5 billion towards the acquisition of Israeli big data and software company Mellanox, though that sale has not yet gone through, and Mellanox has other interested buyers. Joining us now with more on the unprecedented $11 billion investment into Israel by Intel is Dan Katarivas, the Director General for Foreign Trade and International Relations with the Manufacturers Association of Israel. Dan, thank you so much for coming back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, so first of all, you know, what do you make of, of Intel's latest, uh, latest investment? Well, as you said, it's, uh, it's really quite, uh, quite an achievement, I think, for the Israeli economy. It's definitely a vote of confidence for the uh, actually industrial capacity of Israel, because we're not just talking about R&D this time, we're talking about also about expanding production. Mm -hmm. So definitely uh, it gives a very high note to the Israeli economy, especially uh, in the fact that we competed with Ireland, with Singapore, with the United States, and uh, Israel was selected. So it means that we have something to offer, something good to offer, and the company, which is definitely a good company like Intel, know where to look for, for quality. All right, so now something that uh, Moshe Kachlon, finance minister, said about this deal was that, you know, it's really normal to give grants like this or, or you know, really low tax rates to companies to incentivize... Well, uh, look, there is, there is all around the world companies or countries are competing to actually attract foreign investors, okay? Sure. And they're giving different type of incentive. Some are giving tax uh, uh, relief, some are giving uh, direct grants, some are giving, let's say, the help in the development of the, of the land or whatever. Some actually give training facilities, etc. Sure. So Israel has its own program. We have a foreign investment law in which we have a special program and uh, by the way, we're a bit critical of the fact that it's changing from time to time. There's no stability in that. But the fact that the Israeli government will participate over 15 years in actually uh, giving some uh, rebate, I think is something totally normal. And when you actually calculate the benefit to the Israeli economy, they are definitely much over those, uh, the, the money that is being spent by the government. Okay, so, so yeah, so going back to that, you know, Kachlon said if we give them 9% in a grant, then 91% stays here in Israel. Is that an accurate statement? Well, look, it's very difficult to give exactly what, I mean, uh, I'm not uh, uh, an accountant, not, not a Kaplan is an accountant, okay? Right. Uh, the essential thing is that we are bringing here another huge investment. It's going to create high quality employment in Israel. Mm -hmm. It's going to increase uh, uh, certainly export, and it's going to signal to other 
big multinationals that Israel is a place to do business with. So I think that uh, those things are not, you cannot quantify them necessarily only in money terms, in revenue terms, but I think that even in revenue terms, the various calculation, and I, I think the Ministry of Finance know how to make their calculus. I mean, I think there is more, uh, I would say, uh, benefit uh, to the Israeli economy than any problems. I see. All right, so, you know, my final question for you then is with regards to Intel's acquisition of Mobileye, which they did a few years ago, and then now we have, uh, they're looking at Mellanox. Right. Now, if they, if they are to successfully bid and, and purchase Mellanox, how much of the Israeli market is Intel basically owning? Look, look, I, I, we have, I, I don't have the exact figure, but sure. Intel, Mobileye is something totally different. It's in another, course, yeah. yes, it's, it's different, uh, different uh, but fields, But this is, I mean, these are far from the only acquisitions okay, that look, Intel I mean, is so we have a big presence of Intel. We are happy to have a big presence of Intel. I don't think it's uh, uh, too dangerous to, to, we're not totally depending on, on Intel. I mean, there are other big multinational but they, there's no, there's no risk for, you know, a company look, like this getting I mean, too big uh, I think like I was that. in this plateau the other day speaking about Chinese acquisition. Okay, so now mm. we have American acquisition. Mm. So it's good. So the more acquisition we have, from big group, it's good, as long as we keep jobs in Israel, as long as we keep our edge in uh, uh, research and development. So I don't feel of an over-dependency on Intel. We are not there sure. yet. All right. Well, I think that's all we have today. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, Katarivas, for coming in. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for you. All right. In other news, Palestinian Authority Prime Minister Rami Hamdallah resigned on Tuesday and dissolved the Palestinian Authority government. The move comes just two days after the Fatah Central Committee in Ramallah recommended that the government be reformed in order to exclude the Hamas terror group. So now, a new government made up of the various factions of the PLO except for Hamas in Gaza will need to be formed, and elections will supposedly be set sometime within the next six months. Until that time, however, Prime Minister Hamdallah and his government will remain in power. الحكومة تضع استقالتها تحت تصرف السيد الرئيس محمود عباس على أن تستمر بتحمل مسؤولياتها والقيام بمهامها إلى حين تشكيل حكومة جديدة هذه فترة عصيبة على القضية الفلسطينية يجب أن نكون موحدين في كل أنحاء الوطن بالتأكيد الحكومة وضعت نفسها تحت تصرف سيادة الرئيس then, speaking with the Times of Israel, senior Fatah Central Committee member Azam al-Ahmad further explained that the decision to dissolve the government came, quote, in response to Hamas's failure to undertake its national responsibility in handing over the Gaza Strip to the legitimate Palestinian Authority, end quote. Therefore, Hamas will not participate in the formation of the new government. Hamas, on the other hand, blames Abbas's Fatah party and the rest of the West Bank government for any divisions between the factions. <laughs> في تعزيز وتسليخ الانقسام وتعطيل مصالح شعبنا ولم تكن أمينة على الشعب الفلسطيني ولم تؤدي دورها المطلوب منها كما كان المأمون وبالتالي استقالتها تأتي في إطار تبادل أدوار مع أبو مازن وحركة فتح حتى يتم إتاحة المجال لتشكيل حكومة فئوية انفصالية جديدة تخدم أيضا أجندة أبو مازن وحركة فتح وبالتالي Still, Fatah, based in the West Bank, has been at odds with Hamas in Gaza since 2007, when it was violently ousted from the Gaza Strip by the Hamas terror group. And since then, all attempts at reconciliation between the two factions have failed. Palestinian officials, residents, and several international organizations are now publicly denouncing Israel's decision not to renew the mandate for the temporary international presence in Hebron, or the TIPH, this following a year of mounting allegations against the supposed observer force. But again, the decision to revoke TIPH's mandate follows multiple allegations of abuses levied against the organization. For example, over the summer of 2018, Israeli Chadashot TV News aired footage of a TIPH staffer slapping a young Jewish boy in the face so hard that his kippah, or head covering, went flying off. Then a few weeks later, a TIPH worker in uniform was caught on video slashing car tires belonging to Israeli settlers. Additionally, TIPH personnel have been accused of often clashing with Israeli soldiers at checkpoints and disrupting security operations. This despite having the mission of monitoring and reporting on efforts to maintain normal life in Hebron, thus creating a sense of security for the Palestinians. Therefore, after months of intensifying demands to end the organization's mandate, Netanyahu finally explained on Monday that, quote, we will not allow the continuation of an international force that acts against us, end quote. 
Now, TIPH has yet to comment on the situation. But aside from, this, from the Palestinians who accuse Israel of aiming to cover up alleged human rights violations, some foreign officials have also now spoken out against the revocation. In fact, Norwegian Foreign Minister Ine Eriksson Søreide said on Tuesday that she thinks the decision may even breach the Oslo Accords. But critics of the TIPH have pointed out two responses. One is that the T in TIPH stands for temporary, while the TIPH has actually been operating for over two decades. And two is that during that time, and counter to TIPH's mandate, Hebron still remains one of the primary flashpoint centers of violence in the West Bank. Meanwhile, an attempted stabbing attack was narrowly averted today when a still unidentified 16-year-old Palestinian girl from the West Bank whipped out a knife and tried to stab Israeli border security guards. Security officials responded with live fire, however, and the suspect was shot dead at the scene. Additionally, in a statement, Israeli police reported that no other injuries resulted from the attack. Though the checkpoint in question was temporarily closed afterwards, and police are investigating the suspect's origins while beefing up security in the area. Additionally, this attack comes after a weekend of heightened violence in the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem. Though amidst the various clashes, deaths, and arrests that occurred along the Gaza border and in the West Bank over the past week, one incident in particular has gained the most international interest. And that is the Saturday death of Palestinian father of four, 38-year-old Hamdi Talib Nasser. Accounts of how he was killed differ, though, with the Palestinians saying that he was attacked indiscriminately and without warning by settlers, while Israeli settlers from the incident claim that Nasan was killed after an Israeli youth had been attacked and stabbed by a mob of Palestinians, leading to clashes and live fire in self-defense. An investigation has since been launched. The man accused of killing 12 people at a synagogue in Pittsburgh in October of 2018 has just been indicted on additional counts of hate crimes. 44 charges were previously levied against 46-year-old Robert Bowers, and now another 19 have been added. On October 27th, Bowers entered the Dol Hadash Tree of Life and New Light congregations in Pennsylvania, which were all conducting Sabbath services. He then opened fire, killing 11 people and injuring several others, including police officers. Survivors described how they were forced to hide in the vast synagogue as the gunman went on a manhunt for more victims. And after the attack, he allegedly told investigators that, quote, all of these Jews need to die, end quote. Bowers is being accused of 11 new hate crime violations now and obstructing religious beliefs. He previously pleaded not guilty to several counts, though, including using a firearm to commit murder. This news comes after a gay black Jewish actor was violently assaulted in Chicago as well in what many are calling a hate crime. Jesse Smollett is best known for his work on the hit show Empire, and he was exiting a restaurant on Tuesday when two men approached him. They then proceeded to attack the actor, pouring an unknown chemical substance on his body and wrapping a rope around his neck. Many have expressed their outrage at this attack on social media, saying that it's a disturbing reminder of the homophobia and racism that plagues today's society. Interestingly, a Jewish actress from Game of Thrones is also now reporting anti-Semitic abuse, but this time on social media. Laura Pradelska portrays Quaith on the HBO hit series, and she says that she constantly receives abuses online that are related to her Jewish identity and Israel. In 2017, Pradelska shared the story of her grandmother's survival in the Holocaust and even hosted a charity event whose proceeds went to the Sheba Medical Center in Israel. Israel's recognition of Juan Guaido as the interim president of Venezuela is still making headlines, but now, adding to the discourse, one of Venezuela's top opposition leaders, Marina Corina Machado, gave Israeli public broadcaster Khan a video in English where she thanks Netanyahu for his support and then calls on the Jews from Venezuela to return to the country. LTV's Joy Gavijon is here with more. Thanks, Aranas. We can see what's happening in Venezuela is having an impact all around the world. And after Netanyahu's statement, many figures uh, from Venezuela's opposition, including Juan Guaido, expressed their gratitude for his support. Uh, the last one was, as you said, Marina Corina Machado. Machado served as an elected member of the National Assembly of Venezuela and is the founder of the center-right uh, party called Vente Venezuela or Com Venezuela.
All right, so what exactly did she say? You know, we know that yeah. she asked the Jewish people to return uh, to Venezuela. Well, in the video, she addressed the, the Jewish community, talking about how valuable their contribution throughout these years has been for the development of Venezuela. And she went on saying, even though many have been forced to leave our country, we want and expect that they come back to rebuild our nation. And we've said it before, the Venezuelan Jewish community used to be one of the largest in South America, but because of the crisis and the anti-Semitism, they had to leave. Uh, many of them fleeing to the U.S. and many of them coming to Israel. All right, and so now she's asking on all the Jewish expats to come back to, you know, yeah, to rebuild the country. Exactly, yes, okay. uh, but it's never that simple, uh, you know. Anyways, in her two-minute statement, Machado also spoke on behalf of the Venezuelan people, saying that they are looking forward to re-establish diplomatic relations with the state of Israel. She even pointed out that Venezuela was one of the nations that supported the Resolution 181 in the UN uh, General Assembly back in 1947 right. that led to the creation of the state of Israel. Sure. Yeah, that's a, which is a very powerful statement to, to bring up, uh, especially considering that Maduro's predecessor, Hugo Chavez, broke all diplomatic relations with Israel back yeah. in 2009. Um, and since then, you know, the two nations haven't had any ties, uh, and Venezuela has been mostly critical of Israel. Right, yes, and that is something that the opposition led by Guaidó doesn't agree with. Machado also explained that Israel could be a really good partner to Venezuela for the reconstruction of the country, mentioning that they could use Israel's help in the fields of medicine, security, technology, and a lot more, you know. Sure. All right, so now, now back to Venezuela, then, you know, yeah. what's, what's the situation like today on the ground? Look, the situation is constantly changing and it's not looking good at all. Uh, according to the UN Human uh, Rights Agency, 40 people have been killed, 26 of them during the, last, the latest protest, and almost 700 people were detained in only one day, which is something incredibly crazy. Now, yeah. the United States has imposed harsh sanctions on Venezuelan uh, state-owned oil firm, something that Maduro didn't take well at all. And also on the other side, the Venezuelan Supreme Court uh, froze Juan Guaido's bank accounts and issued a travel ban, so he can't leave the country right now. All right, well, we could obviously talk about this for a lot longer. It sounds like yes. there's a lot going on. It's um, getting but, very tense. Yeah, uh, but unfortunately, that is the time that we have for today. So we'll definitely have you back for more on this uh, and on the situation in Venezuela. Until then, thank you, Joy. Thank you, Aaron. Recommendations for a new plan to combat sexual harassment in both the private and public sectors in Israel has just been accepted by the Social Equality Ministry on Monday. And the plan essentially focuses on education and research for better policy making. It also hopes to give authority to the so-called anti-harassment officers both in and outside of the workplace. A total of 35 recommendations were included in the plan, and if put into practice, the plan's 10 million shekel over three years budget will mostly be spent in the first year on massive media and digital campaigns, including the formation of a new pilot website where alleged victims can file complaints online. Likud Knesset member and social equality minister Gila Gamliel explained after accepting the recommendations that, quote, we have to reassert the boundaries of what's allowed and what isn't when it comes to the treatment of women and of all people. Sexual harassment is a violent crime that demands a zero-tolerance approach. That's the only way to affect change." End quote. While the campaign is necessary and sounds incredible, however, many in the women's rights community are pointing out some simple yet major flaws. First is that with the elections pending, it isn't clear if and when this plan will ever actually be implemented. Second is that the budget is considered paltry in size, leading some, like Labor MK Merav Michaeli, to point out the similarities between this plan and that of the plan for preventing violence against women, which still has yet to see its full budget realized too. Others, however, are still lauding the decision, maintaining optimism that the country will ensure a quick and much-needed change. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. In light of Intel's massive new investment and expansion in Israel, today's word is tochna, meaning software. Now, being the startup nation, you can imagine how many software companies or chevrot tochna there are. In fact, you can take my word for it when I say that the number is in the thousands, which is impressive considering Israel is about the size of New Jersey. And that to me is a very good thing, because every nation wants to export what it's best at. And while Israel may not have that many natural resources, we do have mountains of tochnot or softwares that are prepped and ready to help around the world. So, do a little research. I bet you're using some sort of Israeli developed tochna right now. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear and cool with a low of 50 or 10 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow you can expect clear to partly skies, partly cloudy skies, and a high of 66 or 19 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.68 shekels to the American dollar. 
Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching.